Good evening, everybody, um, here uh, in, on the North Lawn, as well as uh, those of us joining, or those of you joining virtually. Uh, welcome to the third session of the Summer Institute. Uh, and tonight's uh, presentation is going to be Space, Our Last Great Commons. My name is Allison Fundus. I'm an alumnus of this wonderful college. Uh, I'm also a, br a brand new trustee. Uh, and I'm also... Oh, thank you. I'm also a National Geographic explorer that focuses on inner space rather than outer space. So tonight, I'm really excited to look more outward with you uh, as well as forward. Over the next hour, we're going to delve into reimagining our relationship with our planet and the cosmos. And we will be challenged to think about how we can extend our environmental ethic beyond Earth's atmosphere and into the near-Earth orbital zone. Leading us through this evening's conversation will be Kim Stanley Robinson, a visionary author celebra celebrated for his unparalleled exploration of ecological theories and research through science fiction. Through his best-selling works such as the Mars Trilogy, The Ministry for the Future, and New York 2140, Stan has taken us on immersive journeys into terraformed planets, submerged cities, and societies grappling with the consequences of our actions. His ability to interweave the intricacies of human nature and the fragility of our environment creates narratives that resonate deeply and invite his readers to confront the profound ethical and existential challenges posed by issues such as climate change, the exploitation and depletion of Earth's resources, as well as the resulting societal repercussions. Each of Stanley's works serve as a powerful call to action in their own right urging us all to be conscious custodians of our planet and to forge a sustainable future for generations to come. Joining him will be a National Geographic explorer, preeminent space scientist, and advocate for responsible space exploration, Mariba Ja. Mariba's impressive career that spans astrodynamic, astrodynamics, as space traffic management, and space sustainability has him at the forefront of efforts to preserve the cosmos as our last great commons. His pioneering research highlights the urgency of responsible practices in our journey beyond our planet. Mariba's work also extends to policy and guidance in public education, including an opinion piece published just today by Scientific American. It's a really wonderful piece. I encourage you all to read it. And that was about how to improve collaboration across spacefaring nations and organizations. Through these efforts, he is a persuasive advocate for space environmentalism, a framework rooted in indigenous tenets of sustainability, an approach that we heard a lot about last night, so that we can ensure the consequences of our collective actions do not impede our future about use of outer space. Mariba and Stan both exemplify what it means to be a human ecologist and ethical explorers, and I'm honored to welcome them to the stage. Thank you, Allison, for that kind introduction. And um, I'm, I'm going to start off with a, a brief introduction of my own. Uh, Mariba uh, Ja, what I want to point out that he might not say to you, although I hope he will, things that I find interesting about him in his biography, um, that he graduated, um, got a, his degrees at University of Colorado at Boulder. This is a center for space science and has been for some time, including the Mars Underground of the early 1970s that published a series of books um, describing how to go to Mars and how to inhabit it that I uh, used intensively when I was writing my Mars trilogy and met a bunch of people from the Mars Underground, which was his alma mater. Then he worked at, at JPL um, doing uh, what could you say, root management for Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Odyssey, Mars Exploration Rover. These are great Mars projects, and I say this as one of the chief living Martians of our time on this planet. Um, uh, they found things, especially Global Surveyor, which was an orbiter as well as a lander, and the complicated dynamics, it, we might not have time to talk about it, but getting something to um, slow down and land on Mars is one of the great problems um, for people doing what Mariba does because 
the atmosphere isn't really thick enough to slow you down, but it is thick enough to burn you up. So you've got a problem, and people like Elon Musk are in fact trying to solve that problem by coming in at huge speed in an airplane like our 747s that is upside down so that it will be trying to crash but not crashing because of its immense speed. So I don't want to be on one of those. Um, Moriba has also been very instrumental as a space scientist to say, look, we're creating a nightmare in space, somewhat like the plastic pollution on Earth in space, space junk, mechanical pieces that stay in orbit, and they're up there. And I want to ask him more about that, but he's, he's been instrumental in what people are calling a civil space traffic management system. And this is important if, because space science isn't Earth science, because low Earth orbit is a human space and necessary to modern civilization, as your phone will always tell you. In fact, uh, be sure to turn off your ringer, and I'm going to do that soon. Um, he's also part of the UN Committee for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. And this is becoming more of an issue. Um, our, our country uh, illegally and stupidly formed a space force, and you won't be surprised it was between the year 2016 and 2020, as a, a militarization of space that's specifically against everything that humanity has done since we first went to space. It was meant to be a, spe a peaceful space, a space beyond um, human conflict and war. And Mariba has seen these problems through the course of his career as a mid-career scientist, seen that things are going awry and has actually worked on them in a way that has been influential. He's a professor at University of Texas Austin right now, but also a member, a honorary fellow of every association that has to do with his field, the Royal Astronomical Society, the American Ast Aeronautical Society, I want to tell you, one time I went to give a talk to the American Astronautical Society, and I, I kicked their ass. I said, look, you, astro, astro, astronomers have to go green. You can't burn up the planet just to look at the stars. Afterwards, they all came up to me, and this was Donna Shirley and Louis Friedman. Afterwards, they said, oh, we loved it the way you were kicking those astronomers' asses like that. And I was going, but wait, that's who I was talking to. I was trying to get to them, and she's, they looked at me. Stan, you just talked to the American Aeronautical Society, <laughs> not the American Ast and I had to, luckily there was just the three of us that understood how badly I was off there. But Mariba does, he, he uh, how can I say it? He bridges these different worlds where many uh, space scientists will be just in the one. And he's acknowledged to the point where recently he got uh, a MacArthur Foundation fellowship which uh, is a great honor, as you know. Um, and you know, uh, I, I have to say, I, I, meet, I, I have friends who got the MacArthur uh, Genius Grant, and, and when it come, goes to um, literary people, and, and they call it the MacArthur Genius Grant, I'm thinking, you know, I know these people, and that's not the right <laughs> word. Um, but when they can do the math, when they, can, when they are uh, scientists that are uh, quantitative and qualitative, that have a, a vision and, a, and ethics and values as well as the mathematical abilities, then maybe it's right, that this nickname that they have for this award. So this is, what, this is what I find impressive, and what it leads me to is I want to know, um, uh, tell, us, tell us a bit about how this came about. Give us a little of your backstory. Yeah, yeah. so um, hopefully people can hear me here. First and foremost, um, I want to say thanks uh, for having me. Thanks to everybody for being here. Um, I would love to have everybody be present um, with us here, and I want this to be as interactive as, as possible, and hopefully we'll get to some questions and answers, but I just want all of us to kind of be here kind of in ceremony as uh, Stan and I go through things. Um, it's a bit long-winded, but, but as I open up, I want to ask permissions to uh, the original stewards of these lands and basically ask for guidance um, and positive and loving and compassionate energies from the north, the west, the south, the east, above, Father Sky, 
below Mother Earth, formidable mycelial network, and the divine spark within each and every one of us. So thank you very much. So. Um, yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, um, I'm a first generation uh, born uh, US citizen. My mom was born in Haiti, my father from Sierra Leone. They met in the Bay Area. Uh, I was a consequence of their meeting. Um, <laughs> they didn't get along quite well. And um, yeah, basically at, uh, at the age of two, you know, parents got divorced. My grandparents lived in Monterey, California, also from Haiti. My grandfather like wrote one of the first uh, you know, US American Haitian dictionaries and that sort of stuff. And my grandmother taught Haitian at the Defense Language Institute. So I was used to seeing people in uniform at the house when I was uh, kind of young. Um, but yeah, at my, my father had visitation rights, um, and at the age of uh, six or seven, um, my father came by to pick me up, and uh, he told my mom that she'd never see me again, and uh, he kidnapped me. And so, yeah, basically I spent nine days kidnapped uh, somewhere in the Bay Area, and when the authorities found me, they put me on a plane back to my mom. My mom was really freaked out. She's like, I don't want this guy ever being able to find you again. And we left the country, went to Venezuela. And uh, my grandfather had a cousin that lived in Caracas. Neither of us knew Spanish. So we just like left and started a new life in Venezuela. And um, I went through all sorts of kind of trials and tribulations. And um, you know, we didn't have a whole lot, but we had enough. And um, I went to a, a military school for high school in, in Venezuela, it was a boarding school. First American I have graduated from that. But basically, um, I definitely got indoctrinated into this whole kind of military thing. So when I graduated from high school, I came back to the United States and I was a security guard guarding missiles in Montana. I had no idea where Montana was until I got off the plane. I'm like, <laughs> big sky. Yeah, it's like nothing but sky country in Montana. And the interesting thing is that growing up in, in Caracas, um, what's that? My earrings are getting in the way. They're hitting the mic. You want me to, okay. I didn't hear that. You know, I can't hear it either. I'm glad that you flagged me down. So how about now, is that better? <laughs> uh, that definitely, I, I heard mean, that. I mean, if I was talking like, hey, imagine if I was, you know, it's like, it's like. There's cool. space junk and then there's um, ear junk. Sorry. I don't have to apologize. Ah. So I'm not trying to like expose myself to you. <laughs> Good enough for Dr. Shaw. Yeah. Good enough for One, Marie two, three. Bob. Okay, here we go. Here we go. So what I meant to say is... Uh, no. <laughs> I'll stop it. Okay, I'll stop it. All right. Um, so the thing is, growing up in Caracas, so Caracas, Venezuela, it's a city, like six million people, the lights are very bright, on a good night you might see the moon kind of thing, but in Montana, dark skies, I'd never been exposed to dark skies ever in my life. And most humans never see a dark sky these days. Mm -hmm. Most people live in cities, they have no idea what a dark sky looks like. And when I was exposed to these dark skies, I realized that the universe is so packed. Because I thought, oh, space is just this emptiness. You barely kind of see the moon. But on a night with a dark sky, you see the Milky Way. Mm. There are tons of stars. Everything's jam-packed. And for the first time in my life, I felt that I wasn't alone in ways that I can't really even explain. And the interesting thing is in that place of feeling connected to like the source of existence kind of thing, I would see dots of light go across the sky, and every once in a while, these dots of light would disappear, mm. and I'm like, and I would tell the other security guards, I'm like, dude, did you see that, man? It's like this dot of sky was going across, and it just disappeared. Like, man, don't tell your supervisor about this, because you have a security clearance, and you might not make it. Like, uh, that's crazy. But I'm like, no, like, I really saw it. Like, shh, don't say that anymore. And when I started doing research, I found out that what I was seeing were human-made objects orbiting the planet, reflecting sunlight, and they would disappear when they were going behind Earth's shadow and being eclipsed. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I want to know more about that. And then that's when I just became inspired to just pursue the curiosity and, you know, get a PhD in astrodynamics. <laughs> 
That's uh, definitely pursuing the um, uh, curiosity. Bless you for that. So, and then, so many of you may have seen this. One time out in the, in the High Sierra, I saw a UFO, two, six linked white lights following each other across the sky, started videoing it on my iPhone, and you can hear me babbling still, because it records on a video. It was one of uh, Musk's Starlinks being launched from Bendenburg near San, Santa Barbara going right overhead. It was a nice to have an explanation because it was truly an unusual UFO type sighting. But we're seeing lots of this stuff. So you got interested in essentially space junk. And it might be an interesting thing. I wonder, are there too many communication satellites going up? Is it redundant? Is it getting, is it getting dangerous or junky? Yeah. So, uh, you know, one thing to, and I'll show the stuff on the laptop here soon so that people can really, you know, get an idea and put things in a perspective. But in 1957, we launched our first satellite, Sputnik. Now, in the year 2023, we're tracking up upwards of 50,000 things ranging in size from a cell phone all the way to the state, you know, space station. And out of the 50,000 things, only 5,000 are things that work. Everything else is garbage. Ah. It's, it's horrible. And you're right. I mean, basically, um, it's like, look, there are places where I could live right now where I wouldn't even have a car. I would just use public transportation because it just makes sense. The United States doesn't really have that much of a culture, right? Everybody has to have a vehicle. I'm culpable of that as well, that sort of stuff. Space is very much similar. Like, people don't want to use this whole idea of, like, rideshare. Everybody wants to have their own satellite to do their own communication, oh, yeah. their own. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there's lots of redundancy. There's lots of communication satellites. There's lots of, um, you know, and actually out of the whole 5,000, you know, over half of all working satellites belong to Elon mm. at this point. And he's got the license to launch up to 10,000 satellites. And he's, he's going to do it. Mm -hmm. The Chinese want to launch their own 10,000. Right. Uh, Project Kuiper with Amazon. They're not SpaceX. They want to get into the business. They want to have several thousand satellites. The Europeans want to have their own. It's like, yeah. And the thing is, these highways are becoming more and more congested, and things stay up there for very long periods of time, if not forever, and eventually they die. And when they die, they keep on going at these high speeds, and it's junk. And this junk, that most of it is very difficult to track, then becomes a hazard to the things that are providing Yes. These services and capabilities that we depend upon on a daily basis. And I got to tell you, each day, more and more of the technologies that we use have some sort of pipeline of information and data that go through space. Mm -hmm. In fact, we know more about humanity and what's going on with the planet because of these robots in the skies called satellites that are taking images and all this other stuff than by any other source of information. And all this is in jeopardy of being lost. Oh, yeah. And... Uh, two ignorant questions. It, is it possible to grab that junk and bring it down? And second question, could some of it fall on us uh, like a school bus and kill us? Oh, man. <laughs> you know, um, I have some bad news. Um, part of it is, yes, <laughs> there, if people, like, not now, but later, if you kind of Google, you know, uh, re-entries, um, actually, Google satellite re-entries. Um, yeah, good idea. So if you Google, I can't believe I just... <laughs> um, we're all human. Look, so if you Google, I just want to protect you. I really care about you. I love you so much. So if you Google satellite re-entries, you're going to find that there are pieces that survive that make it to the Earth's surface that are the size of cars or school buses. And in fact, there's a Chinese rocket, the Long March 5B, that thing just falls wherever it is, and every time they launch it, they, they spin all the world's media outlets, and it's like, okay, then it's like playing, you know, where in the world is Carmen San Diego with a school bus-sized object that could land anywhere? And mm -hmm. people are like, oh, well, you know, most of the planet's covered by water. You know, statistically, it's not, you know, it's the ocean. Who cares? The oceans are big. They can take it, right? right. People have been saying that for a while. But you're going to see pictures of these rocket bodies in 
places where people are standing around taking pictures, so it's not just the oceans. And because we're doing this more frequently, more of these things are going to be falling, and it's going to come to a theater near you, a house near you, a hospital, a, a, a school. is horrible. There's no regulation around that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's bad news. And do I take it that um, this company, Privateer, that you and um, Alex and Steve Wozniak have put together are, is in part an attempt to cope with this uh, growing problem? Is that? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, Alex and Steve approached me a couple of years ago and they said, hey, we've been looking at your work for about 10 years. This idea of environmentalism and stewardship is one that we want to rally around and we'd like to basically develop a business that can provide people more access to data and information in ways where it can help them you know, solve these problems. And I have to say, you know, uh, during, during my travels, um, I speak to many people, um, including folks in this audience that have great ideas and say, hey, you know what, um, I don't want to put this out there because I don't want to be you know, ridiculed, but you know, I have this idea, I would, if I could build something that could do this and maybe could grapple the object and this and that, like what do you think about everything from vacuum cleaners and look, the technology to bring stuff down, it all comes from like the fishing industry. It's like you know, harpoons, nets, uh, hooks, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. And so it's not crazy uh, kind of stuff, but then they say, well, I don't have the data or information to even develop my idea mm -hmm. around that. And so that's one of the things is because mm -hmm. knowledge and information uh, across the globe is, is um, asymmetrically controlled, right? It's not ubiquitous. And people, for many good reasons, are trying to get in the way of people having ubiquitous knowledge and information. So we want to disrupt that very much. And we also just announced today that we want to get into the business of ride sharing and eliminate this kind of redundancy. So we have this thing called Pono, because our, yeah, that's right, our, our uh, you know, privateer is headquartered on Maui. And so we uh, have this thing called Pono, which is supposed to make satellites more like Ubers. And so just like you have this Uber and people can uh, you know, ride share and that sort of stuff, it's like, hey, here's a satellite. You don't have to launch your own satellite if you want to take a picture. You just have to talk to somebody who has a satellite that can take a picture and that sort of stuff and basically give people you know, access to this stuff where instead of paying like, there are companies out there that have these satellites that take Earth imagery, and each image costs thousands of dollars. That's not accessible to me. I don't have several, if I want to take a picture of some region, maybe College of the Atlantic, I don't have several thousand dollars in, in my cushions that I'm just going to pull out. But if we could actually build these satellites where multiple people could subscribe and just get the information that they want when they want it, then maybe taking a picture is like the price of a pizza. And just like with the Uber thing, I have to tell you, when I ride Uber, most of the time, these drivers have no idea where to take you, man. It's like you get into the Uber, and it's like so good that I see point A to point B on, on that phone or ways, because there's you, you know this person has no clue how to take you to where to. <laughs> Many times, you know better how to get to where you want. Hey, you, you should try to go this way instead of, right? But the, the, the point is, is that along with Pono, to try to get people to use the rideshare concept, we have this thing called Wayfinder which we called after the indigenous concept of wayfinding from the Hawaiians. And basically, Wayfinder helps, and I'm going to show this right now, it helps map out space so that not only can we create the Uber, but we also have the ways for space so that people can get to where they want to get to safely and that sort of thing. Absolutely. So you're going to show us something? Yeah, let's Good. do that. Let's do that. Thank you. So basically every single, so this is something that I developed at UT and now um, it's in, with Privateer. So you can just go to wayfinderprivateer.com. You can see this for yourself. But what you're looking at here, every single dot is a human made object currently orbiting the earth. Wow. Let's turn on the rocket bodies. Let's turn on the all the debris because we want you to see the truth here. Okay. And let's see if I can, uh, Zoom out here. Aha. 
There's a Clark orbit out there. Is that so the here, Clark orbit, the white one? Yeah, yeah, so exactly. That's exactly what it is. So this Clark orbit, this geosynchronous or geostationary orbit is where you put a satellite and it takes about 24 hours to go around once, so it's great for communications. Like, uh, it's a Goldilocks place. It's where, where you put a satellite and Mother Nature just happens to curve space-time such that it takes about 24 hours to go around, so that makes sense. But all these dots that you see here, like all these pink dots, all those things came from a single rocket that exploded a couple years ago. Whoa. So it, that's what we call super spreader events. Something, something the size of a school bus that explodes and then creates all these other objects. So when things collide, they yeah. become smaller pieces. When yeah. things explode, they become smaller pieces and they become like very difficult to track. This is kind of, so you can kind of see this and none of this stuff is static. And in, in fact, I'm gonna roll over here and that string of pearls that you saw uh, yeah. yeah, those are the Starlink satellites. I'm going to zoom in. You can see the dots moving. So now you can kind of see. You can click on any one of these wow. things and get like information on that. But this is just a, all this is happening. You know, what I mean, it's pre yeah. it's, the, it's predictive models, but uh, we get data from different sources. You know, every day you can kind of see most of these stuff. It's Starlinks. So Starlinks. when the Chinese blew up one of their own satellites to show they could do it, uh -huh. this was. Um, what would you call it? A kind of a vandalistic. A, well, yeah. A, a, so that's right. I mean, the the basically when you blow up a satellite in orbit, you're basically urinating in your own spring water. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, look, if you like that sort of thing, I'm not going to question you, but don't don't do it for the rest of us. Like the rest of us have to drink from that thing. You know. No. Yeah. No, they got a lot of, of objections. I w I must say. Yeah. I don't know if it led to anything. Yeah. One, one last thing that I want to show here is when people say, well, how busy is this stuff in space? Like you saw this stuff with Wayfinder. Right here, we're asking the question, out of about 20,000 objects, only looking at 20,000 of the 50,000, which ones in low Earth orbit can we predict are going to come within six, you know, six miles of each other in the next 20 minutes? So this is what it looks like currently up there. Basically, the green dots are pairs of objects that are working. Yellow dots, one object is working, the other one is dead. Red dots, both objects are dead. The relative speeds between the crisscrossings are 15 times the speed of a bullet, and the smallest object that we're tracking is a cell phone. So if a cell phone is many times the size of a bullet, traveling 15 times the speed of a bullet hits any other satellite, it's game over. Yeah. And this is what it looks like today. And we're not gonna stop launching satellites, right? So. Yeah. I'm like the oracle from the Matrix, man. I got nothing but good news from no. people. Well, that's a, I, um, I, there are many people who already know this, but I do want to mention that it's called Clark Orbit, n named after Arthur C. Clarke, who as a, um, uh, a space scientist of the, in the 1940s uh, worked out the orbital mechanics that if you put something into what we now call a Clark, or Clark Orbit, geosynchronous, then it'll be up there over the same spot on the Earth and essentially be going around the planet at the same speed that the planet is turning. Very useful anywhere and, uh, and a good place to have satellites if you want to get the same picture of the same side of the planet time after time. So, um, you know, a great science fiction writer but also a great scientist. It's hard to imagine. Um, there are not that many people that do both of our jobs at a, at a high level, but he was one of them. Now, I want to shift to... It isn't really a shift. It's moving onward to the ramifications of this because this particular talk is space as a commons. So let's think about what the commons was and is. Um, it is not unregulated space. It is not a wild west where everybody gets to do what they want. And indeed, it was um, highly regulated by norms that it was usable space used by human beings that did not belong to anybody, that was communal in the way that our indigenous speakers last night was talking about, it has been the human way forever. So when Garrett Hardin wrote the tragedy of the commons, that a commons is going to be destroyed by um, greed, by human greed, he was wrong. The tragedy of the commons was enclosure. The tragedy of the commons was capitalism in closing commons and immiserating the people who used it for their livelihoods. So wherever there's enclosure, a commons has been destroyed. And it's Eleanor Ostrom who wrote the book 
critiquing the hardened view of the tragedy of the commons, what I would call the comedy of the commons, um, or the coping with the commons, living with what you've got and sharing it together, her, her corrective, her critique of Hardin has put us back on a footing. And this is something that at College of the Atlantic, they study all the time because this is human ecology one. What is the commons and how do we get back to it when it's been enclosed for private profit and exploitation? How do we get back to community after private? So public over private and on this island, there's a couple of factors. There's the national park, a whole bunch of private individuals buy land and give it to the community for the common good, Acadia National Park, and a remarkable historical moment. Um, and there's also the lobster fishery, which in fact, Eleanor Ostrom used as one of her examples, along with certain places in Spain and Italy, of um, people managing a commons for the good of all sustainably over the long haul. So the lobster fishery is by no means the Wild West. It's sustained by a group effort, by norms and laws that are together. And so when we, invoke this name of the commons, we are actually trying to reel ourselves back in from neoliberal capitalism to some kind of post-capitalism that uses indigenous values in ways to restructure so that we can actually live sustainably on this planet. And what I, and what I, I, I say all this to contextualize my question, space, it's so empty, it's so inaccessible, it's so inhuman. When we say it's a commons, it's not even like Antarctica, which they often say Antarctica is a commons, and Antarctica's Antarctic Treaty, where we treat it as a international space run by treaty, was the basis, the Antarctic Treaty was the basis for the Outer Space Treaty. But the Outer Space Treaty has never been signed by every nation, including the United States did not sign it, because in the Cold War it might be conceding too much. So we don't have the norms or the laws for space. It might resemble more this, quote, Wild West of you can do anything you want. First one there takes most and, and this kind of acquisitive, exactly what Hardin thought he was describing in the tragedy of the commons. So when you think about it, you, you're seeing it getting junked up like as if nobody ever cleaned up the fishery or it's like these beaches that are completely covered with crap. Um, could we, are there ways of reconceptualizing space so that we understand that it is like our ocean, the Earth's ocean, and, and treat it more like a commons and get back to that again, do you think? Yeah, absolutely, Stan. I mean, that's uh, kind of the premise of what space environmentalism really is, is saying, look, uh, space is like land, air, ocean, you know, Gaia, uh, a system of systems, also has space. It is a finite resource. Um, there's only a, a, a finite carrying capacity to orbits. Once that capacity gets used, we can't use the orbit anymore. Mm -hmm. And you know, the 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 orbit the orbit losing the car carrying capacity means that our decisions and actions can no longer prevent undesirable things from happening. Okay. So if our decisions and actions can no longer prevent undesirable outcomes, for all intents and purposes that orbit becomes unusable. And, you know, again, 50,000 objects, only 5,000 working, 45,000 being junk. Russia, China, and the United States are responsible for most of the stuff yeah. up there. There's probably 2,000 rocket bodies in low Earth orbit. Um, these things are the size of school buses. I showed you the, that one ring. That was only one of 2,000 things that exploded. There's like 1,999 ticking time bombs up there. It's just a matter of when mm. kind of stuff. Um, but it's not profitable to go up and remove these things and to clean the stuff up. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is where I look towards you know, traditional ecological knowledge and the belief of the interconnectedness of all things and embracing this intergenerational contract of stewardship and saying, Look, if everybody keeps on behaving the way they are individually without managing it holistically, then it will result in us not being able to use orbit. And hey, you, companies doing this, that, or the other, even if it's for the sake of your own greed, 
you will prevent yourself from making money if you keep on behaving in this way. Mm -hmm. So the answer is yes, absolutely. Space needs to be regarded as a commons. It needs to be, um, first and foremost, it needs to be acknowledged that it is a finite resource and that it needs to be managed in this holistic way. Because right now, all these orbits that you see, it's orbital occupation. Mm -hmm. It's physics says you can't use uh, you can't you can't be the same place at the you know two things can't share the same space at the same time where bad things happen. Well, it's first come first served, right? And a lot of a lot of these countries that have been doing stuff in space for a long time, when you see developing countries like from Africa who have a dire look, we want to say, oh well, these people in Africa and the way that they're living and this that or the other. It's like, no, Western society is impressing these things is basically pilfering from these people and the same things that they're taking from the Earth are the things that they're using for the technology that they're using to have this orbital occupation. And then they're going to say, oh, well, look, you people from Africa, like, we're going to come up with some norms. We're going to call what we do the best practices. If you can't do what we do, then you can't participate. Really? Are you kidding me? Like, that's, that's crap, man. Mm. It's um, the post-colonial, uh, neo-colonialism is very real in this world, and uh, unfortunately, um, um, United States-backed organizations like World Bank and IMF have been all too uh, happy to uh, recolonize the developing world for the uh, profits of American companies. But this is true, and what I want to seize on as a new understanding for me is this notion of space as a finite resource, because I think of it as so big, because it goes off to forever, you know, 13.2 uh, billion light years away, etc. But um, what's usable by humans is indeed a commons. So this is something really we need to shift in our attitudes towards space to a, a kind of um, taking it for granted as an infinite resource to a finite resource and then shift from a hardened view of tragedy of the commons, just everybody grab what they can get and go for it for profit to an Eleanor Ostrom version of the commons that this is a space we need to share and keep going. I myself have learned something here, and I'm very appreciative. I'm, before, I, we're going to get to questions and answers pretty soon, so I have two what I might call um, spacier questions, if I may. Yeah. Um, we're going to get out a little further into the science fiction land, because I'm wondering about your opinions on this. I, I want to say, this is my friend Oliver Morton. He's the environmental editor for The Economist, and he has a theory. We are not really interested in Mars or any other space um, we're interested in can humans get there or not. So people were intensely interested in getting to the North Pole in the 19th century. Then it was done. Game over. South Pole, Amazon and Scott, intense race to get to the South Pole. When you get there, like there are people at the South Pole right now. Nobody cares. Those, actually, that 100 people, they're having a blast, but nobody else on Earth cares at all. Um, Mount Everest, could you climb Mount Everest? Oh my God, people were dying to climb Mount Everest. Now people are still dying because they're making a bad category error about what is interesting in this world. Um, you know, that you've done the, uh, they're thinking about numbers rather than mountains. Oh my God, I've been on top of the highest mountain. Well, really there are, I would say Pemantic Mountain is the greatest one. In, in, in. Um, it's a silly thing, this most or best. So then we got to the moon and Six years later, we canceled all moon programs and people were no longer interested. One is right to be bored by the moon, and moon is a boring place, I have to tell you. I'm, having written a novel set there, it was harder than hell. Um, <laughs> but right now, everybody's saying, oh my gosh, Mars, so interesting. If only we could get to Mars. When the moment we land on Mars, people will be, it's like, oh, so what? We've done that. It's not interesting. It's another dead rock. It's like, it's like Arizona, but even worse. And then it'll be the moons of Jupiter, and it goes on that way. So I think Oliver may be pointing out something in human nature. We're not intrinsically interested, and this speaks to exploration, the theme of this week. Exploration, what is it really about? Um, human exploration of space is expensive, difficult, and dangerous for the explorers. And people think they want it, but what they really want is the next human achievement as kind of like almost a pole vaulting record. This is my theory. I want to know what you think of it. And then, but it, this is the way I want to configure it. 
Does it matter that there's human exploration of the solar system of space and going to Mars? Or are these robots that we're sending up there enough? Yeah, so thank you uh, for that, Stan. I think that machines are here to help us. Uh, in fact, I think that the only way that we can actually thrive as a humanity has to be with the aid of machines. So I'm, I very much have compassion um, uh, towards, towards machines, and especially for what we have already put them through and for what's coming. But this is all to say that, um, yes, just as, just as you've seen exploration of land, ocean, and air, it's always been led by those that have been most resourced. And then once they have their fun and do their thing and basically you know, take things over or whatever, then it kind of becomes commonplace to everybody else. So you see billionaires going into space, that should be a sign to everybody that soon enough, more and more, this is going to be something more and more accessible to people. Um, prepare your, your sick bags, because it's not like getting on a plane. I guarantee you that. Um, but I think that, you know, with people like Elon that are very much focused on getting to Mars and this sort of thing, my, my guess, if I can see this thing playing out, I can see that we will have humans populating the moon. We'll see. There's some plans for bases, and that's going to be more driven by geopolitics at this point. At this point, Russia and China have already agreed to have their own moon base. Of course, you know, NASA. NASA said, you know, China can't participate in the Artemis kind of stuff, and now you know, China's like, oh, well, I'm going to have my own space station. I'm going so that's happening at the moon right now. Yeah, so yeah. That's but with Elon wanting to look at Mars, to me it's like how, um, how non-indigenous people populated Australia. That's what Mars is going to be. Basically, it's going to be like Elon and everything that he's building, and when people get to Mars, they're going to say, we are here, we're going to make our own laws. If you have any problem with it, come here and make me do something different. And that whole thing is going to take off that way as I see it. But yeah. personally, I don't feel that humans are, there's no rush for humans to be exploring the rest of the universe because I think machines, thankfully, can reduce a lot of the risk to ourselves. Because here's the other thing. People keep on, oh, you know, in all these kind of movies, right, with like, I don't know, uh, Matt Damon, and he's going to science the shit out of things on Mars or whatever it is that he's <laughs> saying, right? It's yeah. like, come on, dude, really, you're growing the potato, and you would have died a long time ago. Like, this is not real. <laughs> but people, they have all these, like, habitats and these bubbles and crap like that. Look around you. We don't live in these bubbles. Yeah. Human, humans have evolved with bacteria, humans have evolved with the scent of manure, with the bees, with trees. So when humans go and populate other parts of the universe, it has to happen with all the stuff that we have to do the Noah's Ark equivalent or else it's not humans really going anywhere. Yeah. So I just don't think that sending people to live in bubbles and crap like that is long-term sustainable. We weren't developed to be that way. No. No. Well, thank you for that. I, I'm always encouraged when a, a scientist supports my English major opinions. Um, um, but it seems right to me. And I, I want to share a factoid about people are going to go to the South Pole of the Moon because the, the Moon, as you know, has that two-week um, rotation. And so uh, half, two weeks at a time, it's in pure dark. Two weeks at a time, it's in pure sunlight. Difficult if you have a station with humans in it. And the South Pole... Uh, Shackleton Crater in particular, which is right at the South Pole, very nice naming job. Um, the moon is not tilted at a 23 degree angle to the plane of the ecliptic like Earth is. That blew my mind. Did, did you know that? That the moon is upright and is the same... Of course I knew that, man. Yeah, of course you knew that. But I'm talking, sorry, to you asking, my, no, yeah, I'm yeah. talking to my audience of fellow College of the Atlantic human ecologists. Also, why the hell should that be? Since they are a co-system and they develop together, how is it that they, one of them is, has got um, its poles pointed straight up and down and ours is 23 to the side? I remain mystified, but I give you this mystery as something to contemplate. And at the south pole of the moon, you have a place on the crater rim that is in sunlight 24-7 all the time. It's just spinning around at the bottom of the moon. And then in its crater, it's dark all the time. So you've got immense heat pump power gradients, and you've got a place to live. And you've got water ice that is accumulated over the eons in that crater 
and we need water bad, and the moon has very little water except in these craters. So uh, now you know that the race to the moon, which is a silly race, will go to the poles, the uh, North Pole and South Pole, but principally the South Pole is having more ice. Um, okay, one more question from me, and then we'll go to general questions from the audience, and I know I'll get assistance. Um, and this one, again, I want to preface it by saying, I want to follow up on what you said. We were not evolved to be in bubbles, so we're never going to the stars. And I want to make this point to make us more um, aware of and conscious of how much we depend on Earth and have to care for Earth. There is no planet B. But also, the solar system is very cool. It is our neighborhood. We're seeing it. Humans could visit it, particularly with faster rockets that we've got. And this is a Freeman Dyson thing. Um, a little nuclear bomb behind the rocket, halfway to um, Pluto. You're speeding up the whole time at 1G so that you're just sitting on the floor. It's like, oh my god, we're at home because we're accelerating at 1G, only to halfway there. Then you have to decelerate at 1G you get to Pluto in about three or four weeks. It's amazing. So, because 1G acceleration, you're, you're accelerating really fast. So the solar system is our neighborhood. But follow me on this. Sil Silkovsky, the Russian space visionary cadet, space cadet visionary, um, Earth is humanity's cradle, but you're not meant to stay in your cradle forever. And then there is the great body of science fiction, 20th century science fiction. We're going to go to the stars. We're, humanity is going to inhabit the galaxy, if not the universe itself. Um, that's wrong. That dream was set up by the ancient Greeks or by the early 20th century space cadets. They, the, Hubble had not taught us how big the universe was. When we got that dream, we thought, we'll just go there. We'll get in a rocket, we'll go there. Now that we know how big the universe actually is, the distances between the stars are such that if you went at one-tenth of the speed of light, which is about as fast as you would get going and still be able to slow down when you got there, then it would take you 200 years to get to even the closest stars. Well, not Alpha Centauri, but Tau Ceti has planets. And so Tau Ceti, 12 light years away, about 200 years to get there and accelerate, get there and slow down. You get there and the planet is either alive or dead. If it's alive, you might be in terrible trouble. If it's dead, you have to terraform it. If you don't know, which you won't know, then you don't know what kind of problem you have. So in other words, when you get somewhere, you're still screwed. <laughs> we are not going to the stars. Tau Ceti, there are many, many stars that are thousands of light years away, and this galaxy is something like 100,000 light years wide or something. So Tau Ceti is a near neighbor, and yet it's still 200 years away. That'd be like five, five generations of humans. We are not even good at staying sane on this planet. But if you were stuck in a room for five generations, then generation four is going to be really angry and really crazy. So what I want to say is we're not going to the stars. What do you think? <laughs> this is the best question yet, Stan. <laughs> um, here's... Here's the way I see it, right? Um, if we, if we are very much interested in not having an expiration date, if we as a humanity want to avoid having an expiration date as a species, we have no choice but to migrate to other stars because our sun eventually runs out of heat. Yeah, billion of years from now, kind of stuff. But, I don't know, a billion from years from now, if we're still in a room like this kind of stuff, if we make it that far, um, then we'll be like, oh, right. Yeah. Uh, then, then, we'll, then we'll be like, oh, my God, what, what are we going to do? And then it's going to be kind of too late. So here's what I think, right? I think that at this point, we should start thinking about interstellar travel. We should think about how we can get machines to help us figure that stuff out. We should, um, along with that, we should do the best that we can to take observations of the sky, which now are getting corrupted by all the space junk, preventing us from seeing near-Earth asteroids, which, I don't know, there's like, this place, out of all places, should know about, you know, dinosaur bones and stuff like that. So looks like something has, you know, impacted the Earth before. Statistically, it can definitely happen again. Yeah. So we should look out for that. Yep. Um, but, but let's say that we, we are able to avoid that tragedy of another kind of asteroid wiping out 
the planet and, and that sort of stuff. And then our only expiration uh, is going to be due to the sun kind of uh, burning off. Yeah, we need to figure out how to get all of this experience, not just people, but like I said, the, to me, the human experience is everything. It's the water, it's, it's the fish, it's all that elsewhere across the universe. And I know that that seems like, it seems comical to me when I just say it, when I hear my voice saying it, right? But it's something that we must do if we don't want to have an expiration date because else it's guaranteed to happen. Yeah. We will well, expire. Yes. Um, I, I, we can definitely defer that problem for five billion years from now. And also, you got to point. I got to point out that this universe is due to have a heat death in about seventy-five billion years from now. So, you know, death is real and unavoidable. And so, I think uh, um, we can let that question rest. Although it just strikes me. You as feel inspired right now, like. <laughs> Um, the point of living is, oh, no. Well, right. accept death as part of it and live while you're alive and take care of this planet. That would be my message. And, and because I'm a science fiction writer, I feel a certain responsibility for the, um, the spaciness of our imagination of what the future could bring. And humanity, this notion that um, if Earth is gone, then um, human beings will be okay elsewhere, I reject utterly. We are bubbles of Earth. Um, this is Larkspur and Candleford, uh, Flora Thompson. We are bubbles of Earth, bubbles of Earth. So we bubble and then we reside back into Earth. We are part of this biosphere so intrinsically, so deeply implicated and imbricated in this biosphere that it's a, well, it's amazing that we managed to spin as a little um, uh, conjury of multiple species, which is what we are for the, you know, three score and 10 years that we do before something breaks and falls apart. It's, that's an astonishing um, act of cooperation, but hard to maintain. And so I, I, I feel it's a, incumbent on me to point out as a science fiction writer that space opera, humanity zipping around the galaxy, is a fantasy just like Lord of the Rings. It's a fantasy space. Good stories can happen there but they are not reality. And when you think about humanity, if you think, oh, we're gonna be a failure because we're not gonna take over the galaxy because we're so stupid or whatever, that's wrong. That's not actually the right goal to have. So I will dispense with religious questions of this kind and um, hope that I get some help opening it up for questions to the, from the general audience. All the way over ah, here. We see some. Oh, I'm all the way over here to your right. Yep. This is just great. Andy Revkin here. Um, I, I want to ask you a question. Hopefully it won't be depressing. But it's about the Kessler syndrome. This idea that a chain reaction with so much junk up there can basically shut down everything and make it uh, impossible to utilize orbital space going forward. And, and is that also a path toward what, what some call the, uh, the big silence, the, the, the idea of Every t does tech is there a chance every techno every technological society kind of screws up in this way? We throw a lot of stuff into space, it kind of bounces into each other, and that's why the universe is quite silent. Yeah. So um, basically, you know, thank you for the question. What uh, you know, Andy is 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 bringing up is this thing called Kessler syndrome. It was a, a concept uh, devised by Don Kessler, who used to be a scientist at NASA. And basically, he, he used some um, um, theories based on particle physics that said, hey, if, if enough things bump into each other, uh, even if we don't launch anything else, there's going to be this cascade effect where then everything is going to keep on bumping into each other, and then it's this runaway train, and then you know, space becomes unusable. <coughs> I will say that I don't subscribe to the Kessler syndrome. Um, I mean, I've looked at the paper, and I actually don't agree with the math, and I think the assumptions sucked a lot. But <laughs> let me tell you how I really feel about it. Um, but the thing is, nowhere, nowhere has Mother Nature shown me that she doesn't achieve an equilibrium state when human beings take the foot off the gas pedal. So the thing is, anytime humans stop doing stupid things and basically making decisions that outpace Mother Nature's ability to provide feedback, Mother Nature achieves an equilibrium state. Now, 
Is the equilibrium state one that we want to live with? That's a different question. Mm. But equilibrium is something that Mother Nature is always seeking to achieve. So I don't believe in these processes that are just like this perilous thing that goes ad infinitum because nothing that I've seen so far as a scientist and engineer shows me that that would actually be the case if you stop doing some harm. Look, in fact, I think Keeley and right, Kill, you guys were talking yesterday. Mother Nature is resilient, big time. If you just give her the chance to show you that resilience, she's resilient. I do believe that the carrying capacity of orbits, that can be consumed by junk, but I don't believe in the Kessler syndrome. So long-winded, sorry, but mm. booyah. <laughs> yep. Hi. Uh, you've got my mind spinning around between two views of space and our culture. Uh, I just finished a book called um, well, I've forgotten the title, but it's about the uh, five previous uh, mass extinctions on this planet. Uh -huh. And he leaves you with the question, all right, it's the one that uh, you guys just talked about, is this, this solar system, this planet, this sun, is not going to be here forever. And do we want to just accept that and consider our culture and the world culture is nothing more than a Geograph a ge geological layer of, in time that there's nothing left of our culture? Or do we want to try to preserve our culture? But the, the question he asks, is that valid? Or would you rather you know, try to understand how you're going to ruin the environment anyway and stop it? So I'm, it's a little confusing here, but there's two alternatives. One is um, we can try to find a way to preserve our culture forever if we want, as long as humans are here. But if we don't spread into the universe, that culture will disappear completely. It will not have existed. No more Beethoven, no more Shakespeare, nothing. Just gone. And can, can one deal with that psychologically? The last point I wanted to make is if you haven't seen the movie, which I thought was pretty good in general, called Gravity. Uh, I thought as I watched it, it was interesting. But you see what space junk can do and what space is like, sort of. I mean, this view of it. And I thought it was good until the very end when <laughs> it's giving it, a, giving it away, perhaps. But the character of interest finally makes it back to Earth. You didn't like Sandra Bullock, did you? Just admit it, man. <laughs> <laughs> How could you not? Well, it was, it was George uh, that I was sorry for when he disappeared into space. But... Um, when she gets back on Earth, she lands in a lake, and she manages to make it to the shore and sink her, uh, sink her fingers into the sand. And it's like, my God, this is the only place we have. And if we don't treat it right, there's nothing out there for us. So those, <laughs> those confusing ideas are boggling my mind, and I'll contemplate them a lot more. But any take you can get from that, what I've said, uh, would be appreciated. Thanks. Well, Gravity was a beautiful movie in, in many ways. I mean, it had scientific glitches that weren't quite right in terms of changing orbits quickly, et cetera, et cetera. But what the heck? And, and Sandra Bullock, when she landed there, I was writing a novel in which getting back to Earth was the whole goal of this uh, failed interstellar expedition. And I wanted to do the Hawaiian thing of is when you escape drowning, you have to kiss the sand. And I was looking at that movie thinking, if Sandra Bullock kisses the ground, I'm going to kill myself. And she, but she didn't. <laughs> So, great movie. Um, but but go, to go back to this thing, I mean, just very briefly, the sun is not going to run out of its fuel and do something, uh, expand up to the point that's beyond Earth's orbit for five billion years. The Earth's only been here five billion years. The average lifetime of any species on Earth so far is about 10 million years. Sharks have lived 300 million years, cockroaches, etc. What I'm saying is that we ourselves as a species very rapidly evolved and probably will continue because of our technological um, innovations. Um, and we've, uh, we've evolved uh, very sharply. Our brains were like one third of the size they are now just uh, 200,000 years ago. You got to do the scales and look at the zeros and do the multiplication. We've got enough time to be humans. The human species will either die out along with Beethoven and everything else, but nothing's eternal. There is not eternity. There is not immortality. There is life in time. And so this is a, why it's a religious question. 
Just accept that there's passage, that there's death, and humanity will have its time like an individual will have their time. It's okay. It's simply okay. And to imagine otherwise, you get into these realms of abstraction and purity and despair and unnecessary non-be-here-nowness. I would, I, would, I would say this, man, just to add to what you know, Stan said, is um, I, f I felt, as you were describing this, I don't know, I was feeling your emotion uh, as you were describing this, and I want to just say that I felt your emotion, and I do believe that we should treat this place as best as we can, because this is our home, and it's the only home that we have, and it may be the only home we'll ever have, and we need to be stewards of it, so absolutely. No, there's a, the mic's over here. Hi, I have more of a comment. Um, I worked two sa seasons at South Pole Station in Antarctica. And it was- Did you say you're a poley? Yes. Cool. South Pole. Did so, you winter over? No, I, so our winter, their summer. It was summer down there. Yeah. So it was like 24 hours a day. It was also 30 below zero. You couldn't go out without goggles, computers, fully dressed. And so when people talk about colonizing other planets, humans want to be comfortable, and it's not comfortable. And when um, somebody was talking about smells, you don't smell anything. You're at 10,000 feet, all it is is snow and sky. And so I just want to remind people when they fantasize about you know, colonizing other planets, it is not comfortable. Yeah. But it's amazing yeah. too. Yeah, and indeed, I would follow up on that, that the South Pole is intensely comfortable compared to Mars. And um, <laughs> you have to imagine yourself stuck in a Motel 6 for the rest of your life. So this is a question from Mariba. What is the solution to the 45,000 pieces of junk? How do, you, how do you get nations together? Are you working on anything? What ideas do you have to to solve it. Yeah, so um, in terms of ideas that I have regarding the current uh, debris problem, I have two. Um, I'm working with, uh, I've, I've been um, collaborating with another Nat Geo Explorer, uh, Imogen Knapper, who's a marine debris person and basically showing, and we wrote a paper in um, science, uh, basically making analogies between the ocean and space and that sort of stuff. So I think Raising awareness, helping people understand the linkages and how we've been exploring to the detriment of the environment. But beyond that, there's remediation and then there's mitigation. Remediation is the cleaning. Mitigation is the preventing of the further uh, um, you know, pollution. I am proposing um, that we have, my first day in office, I propose no. um, <laughs> I'm, I'm proposing that we have a circular space economy that focuses first and foremost on the prevention of pollution. And when I mean circular, I mean in a waste management uh, aspect. And very, very uh, specifically, right now, every single satellite is single use. There is no such thing as a recyclable or reusable satellite. So much like we want to prevent single use plastics, can we prevent single use satellites? And governments could incentivize their industry to basically say, Look, we have a reusable rocket, which Elon did, bravo. Now can we get to reusable and recyclable satellites? So that would be one thing. If things have to be single use, then the question is what does responsible disposal look like? Right now, disposal for most people means your satellite dies and you wait till Mother Nature tries to make it re-enter. When Mother Nature brings things through the atmosphere, it burns up less hot and the chances of it surviving and making it to the surface are much higher. So for me, responsible disposal means bringing it back, but bringing it in a controlled manner so it doesn't just like come in or survive and just land even in the ocean and that sort of stuff. This whole point, Neem on the Pacific, everybody's agreed, oh, that's the place for space stations to go because it's the ocean, it's big, and who cares? So I'm just done with that. Um, build the satellites. If you can't build a satellite to be reusable and recyclable, build it out of materials 
that are guaranteed to burn up in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. but not pollute the atmosphere in the process of the burning up. And so I've suggested even looking at mycelium as a, a possible um, you know, thing that you could build the satellites out of and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So those are the sorts of things that I've been proposing. Wow, cool. One, two. Do I just, hi. hi. Um, so I am a, a earth science teacher and one of the things that is coming up for me right now is Drake's equation. And my kids love to do that, but the one thing that I don't know what to put in is how long does a civilization last? Yes. Especially in the light of like what the, you know, the hearings in Congress with all of the UFO stuff. Like, what do I put in? Because now I have someone to ask, or two people to ask, who can actually give me a much better answer than my guess. So, so you want to know what to put in for how long civilization is going to last? Yeah. Well, yes. clearly I've said it's going to last to eternity because we're going to go and populate the rest of the universe, right? Versus... Yeah, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not going to work. Drake's, Drake's equations, m maybe everybody knows it. Uh, Frank Drake, how can we, how many uh, intelligent and um, spacefaring and maybe radio using alien species are there out there? Well, how many stars are there? How many stars have planets? There are seven... Uh, elements to Drake's equations. And what I want to say is four of those elements, including how long does a technological civilization last, we don't know and we can never know it because the universe is too big for us to ever communicate with other civilizations. They live, they die. We never hear from that at all because the universe is way bigger than we are imagining when we do things like this. So what I love about the Drake's equation is that it is a way of saying we don't know and we can never know. But when we have seven elements in an equation, we can at least say we have quantified our ignorance in a way that is secure. So it's cool. It's, it's lovely to have a, 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 an equation that essentially is saying, this is why we will never know this. That's what it's there for. I love ignorance quantification, by the way. That's a very, <laughs> I love that. Hi. Uh, I'm on your right, or on your left, rather. <laughs> so how effective do you think that something like the DART program, or like Starlink satellites actually, um, they have autonomous collision avoidance, and they, they do manually uh, like re-enter themselves so that they can burn up. How effective are those mechanisms in mitigating space junk, and how effective would they be for not just mitigating, but like cleaning up space junk? Yeah, so look, automation is definitely um, what we need because humans can't, you know, guide and direct every single thing, which is one of the reasons why I say that we need machines. Um, the thing is that machines are going to do what we tell them to do, and so um, we do have our own imperfections and biases, and we pass that on to the machines. So automating things stupidly sucks a lot. Um, and so, yeah, all the Starlinks know where they're at, but the Starlinks don't know where everything else is at. So now you're like automating things to maneuver, except it's like, well, you may have maneuvered into the, the, the path of something you didn't know about. <laughs> so it has to be something that is more collectively done, but automation is certainly um, a path that we need to take. And the thing with the whole DART mission, um, I get very nervous when I hear people nudge asteroids and stuff like that, because <clears throat> there's a certain arrogance that goes along with that. It's like, okay, <clears throat> you have this asteroid that right now, based on all your measurements, is not threatening the planet, and you're gonna nudge this thing, and it's like, every, it's back to the quantifying ignorance. This came up yesterday. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, that now I'm, I'm gonna stand on a little bit of a soapbox here because you've, you've hit a sensitive zone for me. I hope you know that. <laughs> okay, so basically one of the questions that came up for Keolu yesterday, right, was, you know, what's data? He's like, it's everything, which he's not wrong, it is. But um, the thing that I want to quantify more is that data are the result of observations. Anytime you observe, the output are data, okay? And the thing is, because you can't observe everything perfectly, there's always uncertainty involved. And to me, going to an asteroid, nudging it and saying, I know for a fact that when I nudged it, there's no way this is now going to do anything with the planet. That's arrogant, man. That's saying that's not quantifying your ignorance. That's saying, you know what? For perpetuity, I know that deterministically that what I did is gonna cause no harm. It's like, wow, like that's something. Because 
you know, nudging asteroids that all of a sudden might come back to hit us. That, there's a story right there, man. There's yeah, a yeah, next yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe Milton already did that one, but yes. We've got, we've got one last question here in the back. One last question I hear. Okay. Oh, okay. right, guys, this is wonderful. <laughs> um, so I was recently hang out with, hanging out with some Maori, and um, so there's a recent paper that came out that basically um, showed that Maori went to Antarctica some 700 years before it was recorded um, by Europeans getting to the Antarctic. But they basically followed the migration of the whales down there, and they went down there and they thought, hey, they're whales um, and they're good food. We will go and follow the whales. And they got to Antarctica, and then um, I heard while well, I was over there in Aotearoa that um, the, basically the elders said, well, the whales did not, did not invite us to stay. They invited us to go hang out, they did not invite us to stay. Hmm. I'm curious about this from the point of view of space. Um, you know, we've got all those satellites up there, but you know, the night sky, like the dark night sky, and all of the beauty that has our ancestors have been able to see and pass down and have stories with for since the beginning of all of us. I don't know that as human beings, we've invited <laughs> satellites or Elon Musk into the sky to ruin it for us so that we can't go up there and look at stuff. You know, and I, I, I don't know. I don't necessarily have a strong opinion about it um, either, but I'm curious to see what it is, what you guys have to think about it. Yeah, um, I have very strong feelings about it, man, because, you know, um, very recently, I got invited to uh, some space conference where I uh, had a chat with, um, just like I'm having a chat with Stan, uh, I had a chat with um, a wayfinder, her name is uh, Tafwimina, and she um, is from Samoa, and basically, yeah, she said, look, the, the, the skies are changing, and it's part of our culture, and when I talked to the people in Australia, I said, how many people in Australia are looking at the night sky and seeing more dots, and everybody raised their hand, and I said, how many Australian satellites do we have in orbit? Nobody knew, and the answer is zero. So the thing is, it's like there are all these people around the globe that aren't being part of what's happening in space, but they have to live with the consequences of these decisions. And again, it's, it's orbital occupation. And unless we, you want, one of the things that somebody asked me at the UN is they said, if you were, you know, so I'm going to use this. If you were king for a day, right? Of course they would ask me that question. If you were king for, if you were king for a day, like what would you do? I said, you know, why don't you have a council of First Nation Indigenous people to advise you on how to utilize space? That would be a great first move, right? Mm. So that's the thing that I'm advising. Wow. Yeah. I think we should end on that, folks. Wonderful. I've learned more about um, low space orbit in this hour than I have known in all my life previously, and I bet it's the same for a lot of us. So, um, many thanks. I want to say, just really quick, uh, I want to say it's been an honor and a pleasure being here with you, man. It's like, uh, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's awesome. Give me, give me a hug. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Lucky us. Darren. Yeah, what do we do next? Yeah, I should just stop. That we, was, no, that we was give it to Darren. Idea. It was beautiful. Um, so a little homework. Definitely read more of his piece in Scientific America came out today. Awesome. Definitely read Stan's book, 2015, that came, or the, at Aurora that came out in 2015, and you'll learn all of, more of what Stan thinks about... Um, <laughs> reaching Tau Ceti. Uh, tonight, <laughs> there's a sturgeon full moon, which is kind of cool, and it'll rise at 8.30, so peek out over that way. Um, and let's continue these kind of deep thoughts over samba and jazz, and also uh, some drinks up out on the front lawn here in front of the Center for Human Ecology. And then just for tomorrow, let's pick up on more of his points about um, machines, machine learning, intelligence, artificial intelligence, because that is what we're going to dive into on uh, tomorrow morning. So awesome, awesome. Thank you both very much. Yeah.